Hi guys, uh, I'm back again in this video uh, to talk to you about using short pips together with long pips or short pips together with anti-spin. Uh, in the last video I mentioned about beginning play, um, it was pointed out that I really didn't talk very much, uh, if at all, about short pimples, uh, which was an oversight on my part because I guess I tend to, being an inverted uh, player who uses long pips, uh, it's very easy for me to kind of forget that there might be short pip and long pip players out there, or short pip and anti-spin players. So in this video, um, I'll touch on what you guys who use short pips uh, can do um, to win at the beginning level. Now, I hadn't really considered the question um, a lot, so it might be worthwhile just while I'm going through this video, um, just as I'm going, I'll, I'll talk to you about uh, how I came up with the suggestions I did, what were my thought processes at the time. Um, first thing I was thinking of was, okay, well, in order for me to give any advice to somebody else who uses short pips together with long pips, um, as someone who's never really used short pips himself uh, in competition, um, in that case what I have to go for from is, I can't go from personal experience so much of using them I have to go from what I've seen other people do um, and what I know about the characteristics of the rubber, how they work, and give advice based off that. So what my thinking was where I started from um, and where, as a short pit player yourself, where you want to start from is think about, okay, what are the characteristics of um, short pimples? Uh, what, what are their advantages, their disadvantages, and how do they contrast with either the long pips or the anti-spin that I've got on the other side of the bat. And that's where I began. So looking at short pips themselves, what do we know about um, short pimples? And so I made a little list of the stuff that I know about short pimples from experience and from seeing them play. Uh, to begin with, what we're looking at is, okay, we all know that short pips generally give uh, and generate less spin than a normal inverted rubber. So you're going to be getting less extremes of spin, which won't affect you, of course, at the floating end of the spectrum, but it will mean that you may not be able to go to very, very heavy spin, but you'll still be able to generate some spin. Short pips still do spin. And so it means that maybe you won't be able to go from here to here, but you'll be able to go maybe from here to here. So there will still, still be that ability to spin um, somewhat with short pips. And depending on the type of short pips you have and the sponge, where this will be will range a little bit. But there is still some variation. And that's important um, because at the beginner level, and really even at, at any level, all we need in order to win the points is we need the opponent to make a small mistake. It doesn't have to be a big mistake to win the point. And I guess what I mean by that is if you're thinking in terms of going from zero to very, very heavy spin, um, if the opponent makes the mistake with the heavy spin, he may put the ball into the bottom of the net. Or he may, if he's misreading and thinking that it's actually uh, backspin when it's really top spin, he may put the ball that high off, off the table, up in the air. Whereas with short pips, if you fall in using short pips, well, you may get him to hit just below the top of the net or maybe only put it that much higher. The point being though, that's still enough. It, it's still, in the net is still the one point, and if it's up a little bit higher, that much higher than usual, it's still high enough for you to attack. And often that will still be enough to make the ball go off the end of the table too. So although there isn't the range of ex spin extremes, there's still enough to get the job done with short pimples. There's still some uh, room for making spin variation with short pimples. So don't ignore that, that, you can still do that, you just won't have quite the range that you'll have using inverted rubber. But it's still significant. So yes, that's characteristic one, generating a little bit, or even a lot, but generating less spin than inverted rubber, but still some spin. Second thing that we generally know about our short pimples is that to a certain extent it's easier for you to ignore your opponent's spin on the ball. So if your opponent's putting backspin or putting topspin 
or a combination of backspin and side spin or backspin and topspin. Using short pimples, that spin of your opponent affects you less than it does if you're using an inverted rubber. Now that's important because what that means is in terms of your control of the ball and your ability to keep the ball on the table, what you'll find it is it's easier to do that with short pips generally than it is with a uh, inverted rubber. So you're losing some spin generation, but you're definitely gaining the ability to control the ball a little bit better and ignore um, your opponent's spin to a certain extent, which makes it less important for you to read the spin perfectly or very precisely. You, you gain some margin for error in reading spin and handling spin. So that's definitely a bonus for short pimples. Uh, also, uh, this is a little bit of a flow on from the fact that you generate less spin with short pimples, but because you generate less spin, when you come to attack the ball, uh, in most cases, the ball is going to have to be higher off the table for you to hit with the same pace, or to hit hard, basically. The ball needs to be higher off the table because you're not going to get the same amount of dipping effect from the top spin because um, you won't generate as much top spin. To balance that up, because your control is better and you're needing to, uh, you don't have to read the spin as perfectly, what you'll actually find is it's a little bit easier to place the ball when you're attacking and it will tend to go more to the spot that you're aiming. So you'll have a little bit more precision. Um, so it does balance up a little bit in that uh, when you're using inverted, you can dip the ball very fast with the top spin and that's what, that's what makes it, helps make it safe to attack. Um, but you have to read the spin better. So your, your safety mechanism is when you're not sure about your opponent's spin, you put more top spin on aim for the middle of the table, and that's your safety. With short pimples, well, what happens is you can't hit as hard because you can't dip, so you lose some pace there. On the other hand, because your opponent's spin affects you less, you can more precisely aim for a spot on the table, um, and you know you're, you're less likely to go off the end of the table um, from misreading the spin. So that precision allows you a little bit more margin for error there. Um, so I wouldn't say it exactly balances out, but it certainly allows you um, to still keep your attacks fairly strong uh, because you don't have to worry so much about the spin. Now, of course, if the ball's only this high off the table, you're still going to have to get it up and get it down on the other side, and you, that will limit how hard you can hit with short pimples, uh, simply because gravity can only do so much, um, and uh, you're dependent a little bit on what spin the opponent puts on the ball um, will limit how hard you can hit. Uh, but yes, uh, so the ball needs to be a little bit higher to probably hit harder with short pips. Bear in mind though that at this level, um, and really quite th through way to very advanced levels, this sort of a attacking, when we're talking about attacking, power isn't the be, and be all and end all. It's not all about power. It's more about precision and placement than it is about power. Hitting an attack that goes three quarters as fast but lands roughly in tough positions for your opponent and lands 75% of the time is much better than hitting a, an attack that's very fast but only lands 50% of the time and quite often when it does land goes straight to where your opponent is waiting. So placement and precision beats power all the way through really up to very higher levels. Um, at the higher levels it's a little bit different because we're talking some pretty extreme power combined with some you know, fairly solid technique and um, it's, yeah, it's just a different kind of game so but we'll, we'll get there as well. Uh, also another characteristic of um, short pips is that Generally speaking, and I'm, I'm, I am summarising here, generally speaking, they're more effective close to the table. And that's really just a function of the fact that, of the fact that their spin is less. So from an attacking standpoint, when you're well, well back from the table, it's harder for you to get the ball to dip down um, because you, you can't generate that heavy, heavy top spin to, to dip and go. So 
much more effective to be within sort of like the metre to two metres of the table with short pips. If you're finding yourself three metres back um, with short pips, you're probably in the wrong spot unless you're a defender and in that case you would probably want to be a defender with inverted on one side and short pips on the other, not at a defender with short pips on one side and inverted on the other. Um, I'm not saying it can't happen, it's just that I've yet to see a a defender who uses short pips on the short pips on one side, uh, inverted, uh, long pips on the other, or anti spin on the other, who defends well back. Uh, it can be done, but um, I've never really seen it because the spin variation um, becomes a little bit more important for the defend for that sort of defence. Um, it would be a different kind of game. Um, I'm not saying you couldn't do it, but it would be different. So the, the thing I'm talking about here in beginning level play is really to take best advantage of the short pips, stay close, stay up to the table, um, use their strengths uh, for that. Uh, probably just the last thing I'd mention in terms of the characteristics, uh, and that's the usage in terms of the style, whether you use them for aggression or defence close to the table. It, it's, I suppose it's not a characteristic of the short pips so much as it's using them, how do you use them uh, for your style. If you want to play aggressively, the short pips are going to help you by the fact that they allow you to ignore spin and kind of hit through spin without having to read it as closely, giving you a, a better margin for error. You'll have slightly less power because you can't generate heavy, heavy top spin, but at that sort of three-quarter pace, you'll be able to hit very precisely onto the other side of the table. Uh, so there's certainly some benefits there in attacking with long pips from close, uh, attacking with short pips from close to the table. If you want to play a defensive game um, with only the occasional attack, then short pips close to the table can still be good because the control is very good. You'll be able to place the ball in your pushes quite precisely and then just pick off a, a ball to attack. So it, it can be done. There's nothing uh, wrong with using that approach as well. So that's, both are viable, being aggressive, being defensive. And quite often you'll find yourself somewhere in between where you'll be playing aggressive against more some players, more defensive against others. But certainly there is that ability to use it for both purposes. Okay, so uh, the other thing I'll probably just add to that in terms of characteristics is it's worth bearing in mind that although uh, short pips do allow you to a great extent to ignore the spin that's on the ball and hit through. There is also a limited ability or a, a, a certain extent that you can use the short pips, a little bit like long pips, to add to and take advantage of your opponent's existing spin. What I mean by that is uh, the typical example for short pip play, players close to the table is when your opponent pushes the ball putting a heavy backspin on the ball. You can then, instead of hitting necessarily just through the ball flat, you can roll a little bit more and use some of your opponent's backspin, turn it into topspin, and that will allow you to hit a little bit harder because you're using, you're using his backspin to increase your topspin, which then increases the pace that you can hit. So short pips can also do that. And it depends on the short pip, that the really super hard, super fast, short pips are going to do that probably maybe a little bit less than something, a short pips that's a little bit softer and slower that allows you to kind of grip into the short pips a little bit, bend them just a fraction and add to that spin. But both, both can do it to a certain extent. So where that opponent feeds you a backspin ball, your ability to hit a little bit harder um, and turn that backspin into top spin it is definitely there to do it. It also works the other way around. If your opponent feeds you a top spin ball, there is that capability to chop block it and turn his top spin into a back spin going back to him. Or, as a lot of short pit players do, to basically punch the ball and just punch through and turn his top spin into a kind of back spin, um, which can be quite, quite hard to handle at higher levels. Not always so much at beginner levels, because beginner levels um, they don't 
always know what to expect back anyway. So although it's kind of trickier at higher levels where the opponent sees you do this stroke and he expects a certain in inverted block type response, which is a little bit of topspin, and then you punch with the short pimples and you give him a backspin ball, that tends to throw off intermediate and advanced players more than it does beginners. Because beginners, beginners don't often know the difference anyway and they're not expecting anything back. They have no clue what's coming back regardless. So you, you don't trick them. Um, but I'd say that's probably, um, to start with, the, the basic characteristics of short pips that, that spring to mind when I was thinking about this um, last night. Now, what I'm going to do first, or what I'm going to do next, is I'm just going to go to some general recommendations about using short pips. And once I've talked about the general recommendations, uh, I'm just going to talk a little bit about um, the question I was asked about using short pips against a consistent beginner who doesn't do much with the ball and just keeps putting the ball back without a lot of spin or a lot of power and what you can do with that. So we'll, we'll get to that in a second, but let's start with some general recommendations about using short pips. And if I was advising, um, if I had somebody using short pips and long pips, or short pips and anti-spin, and they're in my corner and I'm just about to advise them to go out and play another beginner, but this is the sort of thing I'd be sort of advi advising them to do. Okay, so the first thing is, bear in mind, what are your strengths with that short pip? Okay, where, what advantages does it give you? You have to have that firm in your head. And the advantages are basically that, provided you're staying close up to the table, you'll still get some variation between the short pips and the long pips, or the short pips and the anti-spin, because there is still the ability to generate some spin. So, you still have to, it's still important to do some spin generation. You can't just always give the same stroke, it makes it too easy. You still have to use your short pips intelligently to generate some differences in spin. And quite often, just those small differences will be enough for your opponent to basically make a big mistake. Uh, because um, it allows you to ignore the spin, because short pips allow you to ignore the spin a little bit more when you are attacking, then what that means is what, what's important here uh, is not necessarily... Um, how, how can I put it? It's important to keep attacking. You still have to attack with the short pips. I would be advising the person in my corner, forget about trying to hit clean winners, okay? Unless the ball's up really, really high, forget about trying to hit clean winners. If the ball's just up high enough to start an attack, but only at three-quarter power, go ahead and start your attack. So still attack, and short pips will allow you to make that attack provided you don't overhit. And that's usually the rule with the beginners. Is beginners tend to have like two settings. They have on and they have off. So they have defence and pity patter, and they have full blast. Um, any beginner who straight away gets that idea of, oh, I don't have to play totally soft or totally full out. Any beginner who has that ability to play at 50%, three quarters, and, and attack harder when the ball's easier and attack softer when it's a little bit more difficult to attack. That's usually a beginner who's going to go far because he's already got the idea that certain balls can be hit harder and certain balls have to be treated with more respect. And so there's a range of power and spin that you can use depending on the ball coming to you. So it's not sort of all or nothing. It's maybe three quarters, 50%, 80%, 40% depending on the ball. So yes, still go out and attack, but start attacking at about, say, 70 to 75% of your power. Get a lot of balls on, and if you're consistently hitting balls on, then hit start to hit harder. If you're not consistently hit, hitting balls on, don't just stop attacking. Drop back to 60% and see how you go with that. Cut the power back a little bit. Um, and just also pay attention when you are attacking and you're missing, pay attention to whether you're hitting it off the end of the table, into the net. 
pay attention to whether the ball's going up and off or whether it's going flat and off. Um, if it's going up and off, um, then you're probably swinging too up. If it's going off your bat flat and still off the end of the table, you're just hitting too hard for that ball. So that will give you some information as well. But yes, still attacking is important. You don't want to not attack. Uh, keep in mind also that because the short pips react differently and play differently to inverted, uh, if your opponent is a typical beginner who's played mainly against other inverted rubbers, you'll find your short pips a little bit strange. And so you've basically got two sides of your bat that are both strange because neither of them really play like the inverted rubber that he's used to. So maximise that and get as many balls on as you can. Give him the most chances you can to make mistakes. And that spin variation that you still have is usually enough just to, just to get him to hit maybe the top of the net or just off the end of the table, but that's still a point. It doesn't matter if he misses by a, a foot or an inch, it's still a miss. So still vary that spin and take advantage of the fact that your short pips are different to inverted rubber. Uh, I'd also be recommending use your ball control, especially when playing pushing and waiting for your attack. Use that ball control. Because the short pips control the ball very well and you don't have to worry so much about your opponent's spin, you can afford to, when pushing, you can afford to play, you'll be able to control the ball quite safely and pick when you want to try and chop a bit more or float a bit more. Uh, this, you, you'll just find that your control of the ball and putting the ball will be a little bit better. So that's a good thing and it means also don't rush. Um, you can play a 10 shot rally probably better than someone with inverted rubber because the chances are better that you won't make a mistake because uh, it's easier for you. So use that ball control, put plenty of ball, balls back. Okay, yep, and the final point I was just making here was use some spin generation. So a lot of the tactics that I mentioned for inverted rubber and long pips or inverted rubber and anti-spin they still work the same um, with short pips. They just short pips isn't quite as extreme, but the same principles really apply in that you want your opponent at this level to have as many chances to make a mistake as possible. So you've got to cut down your mistakes. You've got to maximise the amount of mistakes he makes. And in your case now with short pips, you've got better ball control and slightly um, more limited attacking ability. Uh, in terms of your power and how low you can hit the ball from and still get the ball over. Which is okay at the beginner level anyway because you shouldn't be in a rush to an attack a ball. Um, you can afford to generally wait until somebody's, until the ball's up nice and high and easy anyway. So there's no rush. Okay, now those are just general recommendations. Let's actually talk about this specific instance that I was asked. So what we're talking about here is um, you're basically a player using short pips, long pips, or short pips anti-spin. You're up against a player or an opponent who is consistent, but is probably uh, not doing very much in terms of attacking, and um, is just really putting the ball back, and it probably isn't giving you a lot of spin to work off either, is typical. In, the, in these situations, there's usually two situations that you'll find. I mean, this sort of thing. You'll find an opponent who's um, just putting the ball back with no spin, just kind of um, not lobbing the ball back, but just, just poking it back, and there's no spin coming back to you, and he doesn't take any risks, um, and all he does is everything you hit just gets basically either blocked with no spin or just pushed back with no spin. So you, you've got nothing to work off. There's no, no spin to use. You have to generate everything yourself which can be a bit frustrating at times. The other opponent, the other one you will usually find in this situation, is quite often somebody who does have the ability to spin the ball when pushing, um, but that's all he does. So every ball is a medium to heavy push, and he, he's, what he's trying to do is chop you down, push you down, um, and just basically get you to hit the ball in the bottom of the net. 
and um, he doesn't have any idea about floating and uh, changing spin. So every ball is a chop, 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 hard as he can, hoping that you're going to dump it into the net for him. Now, the situation you've got here is those are your two variations. Now, you generally find that they don't have a good attack um, and they don't have the ability to vary spin. And the reason you find that at the beginning level is that anybody who can push consistently and vary the spin consistently um, without making a lot of mistakes generally doesn't stay a beginner very long because all he then has to be able to do is if he can actually push and vary the spin um, whenever, whenever he wants and if he can, has actually an attack that puts the ball away um, you usually find he's, he's virtually an intermediate player by that stage because he can control the backspin game and when the ball pops up he puts it away and that's enough that took me to intermediate level just playing that game you know chop chop float block anything that got attacked to me if the ball came up I just hit it with my backhand I didn't do anything on my forehand side so I basically had pushing on both sides with spin variation pretty much on both sides I had a block for when my opponent attacked me and when he popped the ball up, I just stepped around at any time and hit a backhand. And it, only if it came very high and easy did I hit a forehand, because my forehand technique was very bad. That took me to basically um, uh, my B grade of my local league. Uh, in terms of USA ratings, that took me to maybe uh, your equivalent of probably 1,400 to 1,500, um, just doing that. Um, so within a couple of years, that was my level just from that, nothing else in my game. Um, and um, it works because, because I, I didn't give away any free points, I didn't make a lot of mistakes and um, I just wore down my opponents. And so if you come across somebody like that, you're probably playing an intermediate player is my point. You're not playing a beginner. Because if he's at a beginner level, there's got to be something that he's doing wrong to keep him at beginner level. And usually these guys have either no attack so they can push all day, but you put the ball up and they're too scared to attack it, they push it again. So they don't take advantage of opportunities. Or they're unable to change spin and all they've, all they've got is the float or all they've got is the heavy push. And that stops them winning a lot of the backspin rallies um, more easily because they just have to basically pop it there and hope they'll outlast you. Um, so anyway. Getting back to what I'm talking about, is we're basically talking about this consistent player who doesn't really have much of an attack, but he doesn't make any real mistakes for you um, to win cheap points, and he outlasts you. Okay, what can you do? Okay, first thing is that you've got to do is be aware of there's usually two mistakes that you make that in this situation that will cause you to lose, and they're kind of the opposite opposite ends of the extremes. The first mistake is to go completely defensive yourself and try and out push him. Okay? That's mistake number one. Reason being is if he's just putting the ball back safely and not taking much chances, he's probably also putting the ball about that high above the net and he's putting it towards probably the middle of the table. Now when you've got an opponent who's doing that, it doesn't matter if you trick him about the spin unless you completely trick him. Because even if he gets it a bit wrong, the ball might go instead of that high of the net, it might go that high. Or it might go that high. But it will still, it will still land on the table because he's aiming for the middle. It, it doesn't really matter. You know? So he, he can make a mistake, still land the ball on. So if you try and out push him and beat him that way, um, he'll probably outlast you because he's, he's taking no risks, no spin variation, and every time you try and vary your spin, you're taking risks and you're not getting any, re any reward because he's lobbing it back with plenty of safety. Um, so if you try and just out-push him, yeah, he'll win, um, basically. So you then have to either do exactly the same thing he does, which is take no risks and lob the ball back yourself. And probably if you're like 99% of us, you don't have the patience for it. Um, or otherwise you would be playing that game to start with. So, um, yeah, don't go completely negative. Don't try and out-push him. The second mistake 
is to go completely crazy and try and blast him off the table and attack him off the table and hit every ball hard and um, just go way too aggressive. Uh, if you do that, you'll lose too. And the reason you'll lose is that you'll make too many mistakes and he'll, he's playing safe, um, maybe just putting the ball. And remember, because he's a beginner, he's not taking much risk, but just because every stroke he hits will probably be a little bit different, he'll be getting some natural spin variation anyway, you know, and he'll definitely be getting some placement variation um, in depth and size because he probably couldn't hit it in the same spot exactly if he tried anyway. So the ball will be going all over the place regardless. It will just be landing somewhere around the middle. So if you try and go nuts and attack every ball, well, you're going to still lose. Especially with the fact that with short pips, if the ball's a little bit lower, you're going to struggle to get that ball up and down on the other side. So, and um, if you're attacking, start trying attacking too much with your long pips or with your anti-spin, again, unless the ball's nice and high, you're going to be in trouble. So both of those approaches no good. What we have to do is take a safe middle course that maximises your percentages and hurts him instead. Instead of the other two approaches which really allow him to play his strength and you're playing your worst game. So let's look at what your best game is. Okay. Firstly, because this guy has no real attack and he's not doing much with the ball, Okay. First thing that does is that takes the pressure off you to attack straight away. So there's no need to be over here attacking every ball straight away. Okay. So we can come back and wait a little bit. So if we think of it as a line, there's no need to be at the very aggressive end of the spectrum. There's no need to be here going mad attacking everything. Okay. So we can come back and attack it only when you're ready. Only when it's easy. And you can afford to wait. Because in the meantime, he's not going to attack you. So there's no rush. So you don't have to hit the first ball that comes along. On the other hand, we don't want to hit the 50th ball either. So we don't want to be pushing all day. So there's a range in here that's correct for us. And what I would say is generally, okay, if the first ball is very easy, then hit it. But give yourself at least, probably in these situations, I'd, I'd be happy to give myself three to ten pushes waiting just for a good attack and if I need more I'd take more but usually you'll find against these players that somewhere between the third push and maybe even the sort of like less maybe the third and the seventh you'll generally find there'll be a ball in that range that's good enough for you to attack reasonably safely and, and that's the one to go for and the idea here is having a, a controlled aggression mindset against this sort of play. So if you, if you come in thinking, I'm going to hit everything, you, you're going to be wrong. You're, you're not going to be looking to push and you'll make mistakes. If you come in thinking, I'm going to push everything, you'll be so defensively minded that when the ball does get there to attack, you'll be too scared. You won't be ready to attack. So what you're going to be looking is saying to yourself, I'm going to push until that ball pops up and then I'm going to have a go and I'm going to put it away at three quarter pace. I'm not going to blast it three quarter pace and I'm going to attack it. And if it comes back easy, I'll hit it again. If it comes back hard, I'll push it or block it and I'll wait for another chance. And that's the attitude to have against these guys. Because now what you're doing is you're turning their strengths and your weaknesses, you're flipping it and now what you're going to do is you're going to feed into their weaknesses and use your strengths. Because what's their weakness? Well, their weakness is they have no variation. It's always the same shot. Which means that you know roughly, roughly where it's kind of going. You know there's not, shouldn't be too much difference in spin. And you know you can afford to wait for an easy one. Okay? So that you're using that. What you're also doing is you're basically taking advantage of the fact that with your short pips you have fairly good control. With your long pips or anti, you should be able to put the ball back on the table without trying to vary. You should be able to just put it back on the table. And then all you're waiting for is that ball to go up another six inches or nine inches, enough to give you a little look at the table, and that's the one you hit. And you do that somewhere between the, the first and the seventh ball would probably be, would be plenty. 
But if you need more, if he's a good pusher and steady, take more. There's no, no rush. But you're waiting for that easy ball, and that's the one you're going to pull the trigger and you will hit it. Okay? No point waiting for an easy ball and then pushing it again. When it's up there, you've got to have a go. You've got to do it. And that's the discipline of basically saying, well, that's my tactics, and I'm going to stick to that. I will push until it comes up, and then I will hit it, and I will have a go, because that's my best chance. Um, yeah, and, and really, I think, basically just having a look here, it's safe to take your time, always play that. Yeah. And yeah, that, that kind of covers that against that, that opponent. I think that's pretty much what I had to say. And what it is is really, um, it doesn't matter in, in any of these situations, short pips um, or inverted combined with your long pips and your anti-spin. Uh, when you're playing a different sort of player, or when you're playing different players, basically, there's, there's two options, I guess, that you can go with, go with against your opponent. The first kind of thing is you can choose to say, look, I'm going to play my tactical game the way I want to play, and I don't care what my opponent does, because I'm going to do my thing regardless. And you'll see, um, to an extent, uh, some, some world-class players will basically virtually do that. Um, they just play their game. It doesn't matter what the opponent's doing. They just try and do their game as well as they can. And if the opponent's better on the day, then too bad. They won't change tactics. Um, other players um, will basically go out there and they'll say, okay, this is what I want to do, but if their opponent's making it hard for them, they're not, they're not afraid to say, well, in that case, I'm going to change to something else, and I'll look for another way to beat my opponent. And, and those are the people who can make a tactical adjustment during a match. Now, there's trade-offs of both. I'm not here to say one, one approach is better than the other, um, that, that you, know, you have to do you should stick to the tactics all the way through, or that you should always be changing, looking for the best solution. I think, for myself, I tend to be the kind of person who's always looking for a... If I'm struggling, I'm looking for a new set of tactics myself, rather than uh, trying to use the same tactics regardless of the opponent. Um, but that's me, that, that's just the way I am. Um, you have to think about that a little bit for yourself as well, in terms of whether you're better off forgetting about your opponent and just saying this is how I want to play and all I'm going to do is train and play exactly that style and try and get as good as I can at it. Or whether you're the kind of person who'll say, well look, if I'm going to train for plan A but I'll also have a plan B in case that goes wrong and maybe a plan C if that doesn't work and you'll be constantly adjusting. Uh, it's hard to say whether one's really better than another. I mean, you can look at um, Look at some of the, someone like a Waldner who you know, can change tactics, do this, then do that, and if that's not working, he'll go to plan B. Versus someone like um, maybe a, a, a Wang, Le, Wang, Le, Wang Le Quinn, um, or maybe a Krianga. Those sort of guys who, who have a style, do what they do very well, but you don't see a lot of change or variation in tactics. And if someone can beat them on the day, well, they'll go down playing the same style. Um, which is better? Neither. It's your own temperament in that respect. I All right, back again. Sorry there, got some. It wasn't a battery outage this time. Um, my hard disk was actually full because I hadn't bothered to clean off the camera for um, a couple of months. So, uh, yeah. So, that's really... Uh, covering pretty much what I wanted to say about the short pips um, using with long pips and anti-spin. It's not just about, uh, in this video, just, just to summarise, it, it's basically the idea is it's even though as I'm not a short pip user myself, the principles are really the same and, and the thought processes are also good to understand. And it's a, a case of really understand the characteristics of the rubber that you're using whether it's short pips, long pips, um, inverted rubber, doesn't matter. You need to have a good grasp of what it can do. What is, its, what is that rubber's strengths? What is it good at? What is it bad at? What is it okay at? If you then have a good grasp of what it can do, 
you can then start to see whether that, how well it applies to your game and how you can use it in combination with the other rubber to maximise the game that you want to play. And so it doesn't really matter. You can be you can use any combination almost. Perhaps not long pips and anti spin together because that's um, you're not getting a lot of variation there. But it really, other than that, doesn't matter. It's a matter of just really saying to yourself, okay, this is what my rubbers can do. This is what I want to want to do or I want to achieve. This is how I can go about it. You know, I can use this effect to do that. I can use this effect to do that. My rubber doesn't do that very well. How can I hide that? How can I cover that up? And if you ask yourself those kind of questions, what you'll find is your game will improve because you'll naturally be working on the areas that you're strong. You'll be playing a game that's using your strengths. You'll hopefully be trying to hide where you're not so good um, or where your rubbers aren't so good. You'll be trying to hide that up and cover it up, make it harder to get at. And at the beginning level, um, where, to be honest, technique is quite often quite shaky. People are not great on technique. Um, tactics are virtually non-existent. So at the beginning level, all you really need is a couple of reasonably sound techniques, reasonably stable techniques, and the intelligence to use them in the best way that you can, and that's usually enough to take you up to intermediate level. And it's that intermediate level to an extent where the fun begins, or the or, yeah, certainly tactically wise, I think where the fun starts to begin, because that intermediate level, it's where you're first getting that kind of mastery of certain shots. There'll be an intermediate level quite often. There'll be shots that you can play quite well, but there'll also be probably some really shots that you play very very badly, and some that are mediocre. And the fun at intermediate level is trying to maximise your good shots, hide your bad shots, improve the okay shots and blend that into a, a game or a style that suits the way you like to play and is also effective against a particular opponent and his style and his strengths and his weaknesses. And um, that's, for me, I find that quite interesting um, table tennis wise. It's, it's almost like it's the chess aspect of it. Um, these are these are the abilities and your weapons where you're strong, where you're weak. He's got these abilities and these weapons. How can you use your weapons to beat his weapons? You know, and that, and that for me is quite um quite fascinating. Whereas sometimes some of the technique terms, um, practicing four you know four hands for half an hour to just improve your forehand technique, it's essential, but it's not exciting. It's not interesting per se. Whereas tactically, I find the tactical side of things, um, for me, quite interesting um, to watch and to discuss. Whereas um, some of the technique things, well, there's always new things to learn, but um, I don't find it quite, um, you know, just doesn't excite me personally as much as discussing tactical things. So anyway, um, next video, which I'll hopefully be getting onto tomorrow, um, we're going to start looking at the intermediate side of the game and have a bit of a discussion about uh, what intermediate play uh, is characterised and defined by, uh, what, what would make you an intermediate level player, and what you need to do at the intermediate level, uh, not only to maybe win at the intermediate level, but to start nudging yourself up towards that advanced level and um, getting into advanced level play. And so um, I'll be uh, hopefully getting into that uh, for you all tomorrow.